joining. I'm very excited to be presenting this eighth uh, webinars of our executive series. I'm joined today by Kane Goulden, uh, Senior Leasing Manager at QE Property, and Jay Curtis, Change Manager at TNG. Um, they are the stars of the show today. I'm going to try to speak as little as possible to let them express what their journey has been. They have some great insights and uh, future focused ideas to share with you. Um, without further ado, we'll kickstart. In terms of the agenda, um, I'll go through a couple of slides and data. Overall, there is no clear answer to how to improve the office utilization. And I'll start this webinar by saying that we don't have one answer today. This is really to share knowledge, um, share ideas, so that together we can get to a, sol uh, a solution that suits employees, businesses, and communities. Uh, afterwards, I'll hand over to Jay, who will talk through his journey with TNG. They've gone through an incredible transformation recently. And afterwards, uh, Ken will be talking through some of the incredible things they are doing at Sylvia Park in Mount Wellington, and how this is helping shape the uh, workspace environment of tomorrow. Towards the end, uh, we will open up for questions. Please put your questions in the chat box and I will read them out afterwards. So uh, we'll be able to answer those for you. Um, also, um, please ensure uh, you are sit properly, that you have your exit in sight in terms of health and safety, and that uh, you know where to exit in case of an emergency. So without further ado, welcome. Um, hybrid work massive disruption ever since um, two years ago it was already a trend that was growing, but um, we can see now it is really establishing itself. Uh, a few key data points here from surveys overseas, a mix of Accenture, Microsoft, and our own surveys in New Zealand. But broadly, what this paints is that hybrid work is successful. Um, we can, but very little companies, only one fifth have a proper uh, work, hybrid work policy right now, which means they're still finding out how to actually implement it properly. Uh, hybrid is good for business. It's used by 63% of high growth company. And when you don't adopt it, it looks not as great. 69% of companies with negative growth reject the hybrid model. Uh, it's great for the Gen Z because they do want on-site experience, interestingly, more than their peers and their older peers. 84% of employees say they would positively and willingly come to the workplace if they are assured they can socialize with others. So what that touches on here is often one of the problem is people come to the office and there's no one in it. So that paints the importance of really structuring the approach uh, on that perspective. A few other data points here from this, this is a study from Gallup that talks to where people are going to work uh, in the future. It will settle in the middle between employers' desires and employees. But broadly, we can see compared to the pre-pandemic, remote working is really increasing and full on-site has decreased uh, significantly. In terms of hybrid policy, which we touched on a moment ago, as I said, there's no one answer fits all. And I think this data that I've collected here is to show the diversity and to show how critical it is to really engage with employees when designing those uh, workplace policies to drive office utilization. There is disparities between ethnicities on how many days, full days they want in the office, disparities between um, men and women and employee and employer. We think it's gonna settle around three days in the office, but beyond that, there's actually a potential that it's not going to be about days but asynchronous work which means people are able to work whenever it suits them and whenever it's more productive for them um, hybrid work patterns they are changing the way people are accessing real estate we can see that from our own data here which is a, collect a collation of several uh, projects and several utilization points that we've collected what's interesting to see is that collaboration space is the most used by far with desk in the meeting rooms being the least utilize or the least uh, efficient in utilization. Um, this data here shows you that only one third of meeting rooms are used at a 50 plus percent capacity. And on the right side shows you some insights into how long these meetings are. This is important down the track. We'll come back to that shortly. Um, some further insight from our utilization data tool. You can see here the average daily utilization when we aggregate 
all the work points is very low, with peak being at 50%. No surprises here. What are we seeing overseas and what can we learn from other businesses and what they're doing? Well, first off, food traffic in the main US cities and UK cities is stabilizing at about 60% of pre-pandemic levels. So there is still um, way behind what we were seeing before. We're seeing a complete shift away from lower grade assets. Reason is, of course, now that employees have the choice to come to, to the office, they don't want to do that in suboptimal conditions. There's massive growth in green workspaces, looking at green leases, green buildings that have a much lower um, carbon footprint. Utilization is becoming critical for CRE leaders on how to measure the performance of their office, along with uh, a rise of other uh, key metrics. Adoption of flex workspace, what we call flex workspace is fully outsourced, so a component of your um, workspace or real estate strategy is fully outsourced to cater for remote workers closer to home, to cater for peaks and trough in the occupancy that drives utilization and adopt a uh, core and flex or hub and spoke model. Hospitality and experience led, this is becoming critical to attract and retain people in the office. Rationalization of workstations in London and the US for newly designed workspaces, we're seeing ratios of up to one desk per three headcounts. Doesn't mean there is no work point for everyone, but the traditional workstation, individual workstation, is reducing significantly. And we're seeing finally adoption of tech workplace technologies that can measure utilization for those companies that have longer lease tails remaining so that in the next iteration of design, they can use this data to really inform the design and drive utilization. Why is utilization important? First off, productivity. When people have a workplace that's purposeful, that suits their needs, they occupy it and they, of course, uh, are more productive in it. Um, it drives culture. 97% uh, of people say physical space key to, to culture, and companies that have a strong culture usually deliver four times the revenue growth. In terms of efficiency, aligning your real estate with hybrid work patterns can reduce rental costs, total occupancy costs, and increase the ROI on your capex. This is particularly important in New Zealand because rental sits at six, the 60th place globally, so quite low rentals in New Zealand. However, the capex is definitely important, which means very key from a CFO standpoint to start the journey from um, not only the real estate piece, but the design and uh, fit out element. Finally, sustainability. Yes, it's important when we increase utilization, obviously over the long term, we reduce the number of new buildings that are created. That's number one. We also enable companies by reducing footprint to shift to greener buildings, which has over time a lower uh, impact on the environment. And finally, work hybrid patterns reduce uh, the footprint and the infrastructure, the pressure on infrastructure, which drives sustainability and positive outcome. How can we address it? And as I mentioned, this is not for me today to tell you how, but we will discover that with Jay and Kane. Number one, design like transformation, and Jay will talk about that and how um, that works for them. Staff positive behavioral change, the, the transformation and bringing people, in, involving them in the journey to design that new workplace is critical. Adoption of flex, this reduces the underutilized and surplus space, which ultimately increase um, profitability, cost, and sustainable outcome. One of the key will be tenant landlord relationships. This is critical because the new workspace will be very different than the one we have to date. And it's critical that tenant and landlord really work in partnership to address that shift. New buildings are more expensive, but we need smaller footprints and a workspace that's designed differently. So really working together with landlords and tenants uh, is quite critical. And finally, and that's a point from Jay, experiment and adapt. There's no it's very unknown at this stage. We're seeing some trend emerge, but we'll still discover what this new norm uh, means. And I'll close up before I pass on to Jay by saying, I think we'll see 20, 30, 40 years from now, we look back at what happened in 2019 and we'll remember it probably 
as an event that was as important as the, as the industrial revolution. So that's a big comment, but I stand behind it. Without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Jay, who will tell you about um, his experience. Hey, thanks, Pierre. Re really appreciate that. And hi, everybody. Um, and, and I guess just to build on the comments that Pierre's made, you know, every journey is, is different. Um, you know, this is a TNG Global kind of journey and how we approach this topic um, on th that side of it. So um, let's get started. So I guess let's start with a bit of background. Um, so uh, TNG, uh, for those that, that don't know us as an organisation, we're involved in fruit and, and, and produce, both um, locally and also internationally, so from growing to distribution to IP, um, exports, etc. on that, that, that side of it. Um, we had... We, 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 we have a very large site in Mount Wellington. It's in an industrial area. And so um, really provided for our staff limited access to public transport and, and challenges with kind of walking to any sort of cafes or if you wanted to go and get food, you were kind of having to hop into your car and, and, and away you'd go. As we, as we were a large site, and, and some of you may relate to this, but we had our team spread across three distinct different buildings on the site. And, and in the next slide, I'll kind of give you a site map just to help anchor this point in. Um, so essentially, in, so the outline shows the entirety of the site. Um, so a large physical site, and then the three green shapes identify where our teams were based. So in shape number one, that was our uh, group office where we had essentially our executive team, our people, people and culture team, our marketing team on that side of it. In box number two, we had our international team. So the team that would be dealing with our offshore partners and, and entities on that side of it. And then in box number three, we had our technology team and uh, our, our finance team. So all, you know, you, you were going for a decent walk to actually, you um, kind of connect with other people in a face-to-face -face kind of way. Um, and actually, when I did look at this image, um, actually, you'll see right at the bottom of the screen, there was the TNG Human Resources. So we actually originally started with four locations, uh, but the people and culture team, HR, had moved into into space number one to try and again improve that, that point um, on that, that side of it. Um, going back to the previous slide, please. Um, so from, from a site point of view, because we had been on the site for such a long period of time is a really traditional way of working. Everybody had their desk, everybody had their um, stuff all over it. You knew where people sat um, on that side of it. Our executives all had offices. Um, so again, there were just offices available and it was really just a kind of that traditional historical way of, of I guess, people utilizing the space. As, as Pierre mentioned, and, and it's a big call, I think, in terms of whether, whether it relates to the industrial revolution or not but um you know COVID came along and so from a TNG perspective our approach there was really around keeping business continuity flowing um you know we, we were in a central service in terms of food the food supply chain um so from a, a TNG global perspective if you were an office-based resource or person you were working from home um as, as the, the norm to help reduce any risk of COVID spread through our operational teams, the people picking the produce, preparing it to go out to the supermarkets and, and independent grocers and, and, and so on on that, that side of it. So we, we, like a lot of companies, went through a really big period of time where all of our office-based people were working from home um, on that side of it. As we started to come back into the office, there were certainly days where, because the teams were spread across um, three different sites and we had about 150 people impacted by our move, you would certainly have times when it would feel like it was just you and one other person in an office space. So you, you would go into work and potentially not see anybody um, in, in certain situations. So it, it really removed any significant desire to come into work unless working from home wasn't um, possible for you in a productive kind of way. So in terms of, a, I guess, a bit of a brief, um, we originally owned the piece of land that we were on and we, we sold it. So we were looking for a new a new home for the, the team. And so really it was about creating in a, a modern environment that, as Pierre has mentioned, really in supports and encourages people to come in to the office um, on the, the, that side of it. So I guess that's a bit of the background um, and the reason that, that we did move and kind of where we've come from in terms of quite a physically separated team structure. 
on their side. So our approach, our approach to this um, dynamic, and again, it was really about trying to find our way forward. Um, again, we had looked around, there wasn't a cookie cutter approach that we could kind of go, actually, this is what we're going to do. So we went out to our staff, we actually looked to engage with them about actually why they came into the office and all the things that Pierre has mentioned did come through in terms of people coming into the office to um, connect with people, to collaboration, for, you know, for purposes of, of collaboration and so on. Those face-to-face -face interactions was really why they were coming in to it. So we knew whatever space we created had to really be supportive of, of that. Um, from there, we kind of worked out what, what we needed. Um, and so across those sort of three sites, um, we worked out that we were able to physically shrink our footprint down by about 35%. Um, and probably again, uh, Pierre, you, you, you've mentioned that um, some companies don't have policies around actually the hybrid working and how that works. And so this uh, opportunity of a change of physical environment really created an opportunity for TNG to formalize actually as we're coming back into the office, what is the expectation? Um, and so for us, we have our flow policy, which is where there's an expectation of two days in an office. Uh, we do have other offices around uh, other operational sites, which people can work from as well. Um, so two days a week in an office on that side of it as the minimum, uh, with some people absolutely choosing to work five days a week in the office because that kind of suits them. So we worked out the spacing requirements, we did a property search that kind of narrowed it down. And again, our desire here was around a sustainable building, a modern building, something that actually had great access to um, amenities, public transport, all the other things that actually were important to us from a sustainability point of view and, and our people as well. In terms of then looking to go, how do we take uh, an organisation that has been you know, working in a traditional way, certainly we have had people who have joined the organisation who had worked in, in other um, styles. Um, so we went through and we created some sample uh, layouts for the executive team to be able to consider and understand. We gained data around actually the ratio point of actually how aggressive were we being in terms of formal workstations, dual screens, um, relative to other organizations and, and how they were finding that. And so from a TNG point of view, we kind of landed in the midpoint. We were comfortable that we weren't being too aggressive, um, but we were able to kind of go forward with that. And then from there, we actually established um, our Steerco um, model to really have a focus executive group around the, the change of the transition on that point was also then a key focus around the change management approach, cross, cross functional teams, engagement of the business, and how those different business teams were working, what was important to them. So, as we brought it into one physical space, um, we could actually capture that, and then also looking at the readiness for move on that point. So, if we go through to the next slide, what you can see here is a layout. Um, but on the right hand side, what you're seeing is we created a really broad range of physical working spaces. And the intention here was to, as Piers mentioned, um, you know, we're, we're here for a decade. And it was to look at creating some initial spaces. We've got still lots of room, like we haven't actually over um, crammed it in the, the desk. So we have got lots of room to actually flex or evolve in how we're working. And from a journey point of view, Pierre, I thought your comment before around the collaborative spaces is really interesting. Um, we're still on that journey. So at the moment, our highest utilization is the, the workstations, dual screens is where the, where the most of the team are working. People are using the couches and so on, but not necessarily the collaboration spaces that we've created to date um, on that point. And also, you know, we, we did certainly look to recycle the um, the, the furniture where possible. The, probably the, the key call out really is we did have lots of meeting rooms because people being able to have private conversations, confidentiality was considered to be really key and important. And on the left-hand side, you'll see um, an area with three tables in the middle. So that was our cafe. So from a cafe point of view, we identified that actually creating a space that was like a cafe, large, we've got a, a proper coffee machine for those that like coffee, um, to be able to come in and hang out and, and catch up with your, your colleagues relative to what we had. So we've kind of doubled plus what was available across those three different sites into one kind of area. The other kind of key change that we worked through with the business was around activity-based working. So again, getting people's heads around um, how that would work as opposed to having your desk that you go to every every day on the, the, that side of it. 
So that was kind of a bit of the journey. And then I guess from a learnings and insights point of view, yeah, we are on the journey. So if we come to the next slide, um, what we can see here is that, again, as per the, the data that Pierre had indicated, midweek is where we, we were busiest. Um, Friday's still pretty quiet. Um, but what's actually really nice is on a Friday when it's quiet, it doesn't feel like there's tumbleweed blowing down the, the, the office because there's actually enough people around to create a sense of energy and so on um, on that point. In terms of adoption, we, 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 we staggered um, the start of that. So again, just helping with that, that transition. We standardized on the, the technology so people could actually just you know, sit in any desk. So we don't have any, any desk booking technology at this moment. Um, we started with low technology for booking of car parks and or desks to see how that would go. Um, and we really caught out to the teams around a three month review. We would try things for them to be open to new ways of working and giving us feedback. Um, we were really strong in our, in our TNG global graphics that we have on the premise around it to make it feel like our place and the new mindsets that we had introduced as well. Um, and as mentioned, we have got a formal review um, to sort of get feedback from, from the team that are coming up. So we're on the journey. Um, feedback to date has been really, really positive, um, you know, relative to what we were working in. Um, our previous offices were tired. Lots of natural light and modern office has been really attractive and appealing. So the investment in a better quality of building location was really important, close amenities and so on. And the next couple of slides are just some of the images. Oh, sorry, I've got more there. Um, three months transition, strong executive modeling. Actually, that was really interesting. Um, again, our, our executives are on the floor with everybody else. So again, they have adopted that in, in a large kind of way. Um, and again, a good transition from the project to a BAU team. And then now some images on um, essentially what we've created. So you can see some graphic walls here. So really bringing the TNG global feel to life, some of the products that we, um, and projects that, that we uh, grow and export on that side of it. Um, and then coming through to the cafe at the top left. Um, so a good sort of space for people to be able to meet as well as smaller private meeting rooms and different sort of working spaces and style on that side of it. So yeah, so that's our journey. Um, Thank you, Jay. Um, I think we'll, we'll come back towards the end for, for questions. I see there are, there's already one. Uh, please put them all, all on, the, on the chat or the Q&A box. And when we reach the end, we'll have plenty of time uh, for questions. Um, that leads me to our next um, guest speaker today, Kane. Thank you very much for joining. Why I wanted you to join here because what I've been seeing from our travels overseas, especially in France and the UK, is that concept of um, second or suburban CBDs, where the <clears throat> the push for everyone to work from home really has made them even more resent the traffic and realize that there's there's a portion of people who don't want to work from home, don't want to come to the headquarter office either, because um, either they're the younger workers, they don't have a proper setup at home, or they're just um, that work persona that needs a different environment to get energized, to get ideas, and so on. And uh, with what you're doing at Sylvia Park, I think you're ticking all the boxes for, for that transformation, which is amenities readily accessible for people, which drives them to come to the office, and all the rest I will uh, leave to you to, to talk to. So right. thanks, Kane. over to you. Thanks, Pierre. Thanks, thanks, Jay, and um, morning all. Um, well, today, I just wanted to give everyone a bit of overview of what we're doing at Sylvia Park. We've got some really exciting developments happening and the, the change and evolution of Sylvia Park is what we know it today. Um, next slide, thanks, Pierre. Oh, sorry, you'll leave this one. So, um, you know, from Kiwi Properties' point of view, we're in the midst of a transformation to intensify our assets to mix use assets. It's a multi-year journey and we're currently making a substantial process on that journey. And what we're really trying to do is provide a broad range of uses to our asset class. We're, we're a long-term holder of property and developer, and you, you may know us as some of our assets we've developed, Sylvia Park, which I'm going to detail here. However, from an office portfolio point of view, we've got a, a large MBS portfolio with the Vero Centre, which we built and developed 20 years ago, through to ASB, which you know, has developed bespoke for ASB in almost 10 years ago as well. So what is mixed use? I, I think it's probably important to provide some clarity what we define as mixed use and why we believe it's the future of Kiwi property. 
Minutes use is about co-locating a number of complementary uses and property types on the same site. It isn't just an aggregate of different assets classes. In our view, it's actually an assets class in its own right. So, there are a number of examples of mixed use from around the world. So there's, there's King's Cross in London, Assembly Row in Boston, and that's just to name a two of many that are available. In New Zealand, we see Britomar as an excellent, excellent reference of a carefully master-planned, well-executed development. It combines office, retail, dining, entertainment, hotel, and it's on top of the train station. Each building is well done in its own right. However, it's the sum of the parts that make a great placemaking, and that's why it's so successful. So Kiwi Property's vision is to create a series of comparable mixed-use centres that, like Brunemart, bring people together and bring different property uses that bring people to live, work, shop, and play. Here you can see three of our mixed-use assets being Sylvia Park, Linmore, Jury. Due to the zoning of these assets, we have the ability to build up to 72 metres in height across all of them, and which offers significant potential. Two of these locations are already designated by the Auckland Council as metropolitan zone centres, and Jury, having recently had a successful plan change, uh, it's imminent in the coming weeks that we expect this to be zoned as metropolitan as well. When this happens, Kiwi will have mixed-use assets at the very heart of three of the 11 key metropolitan centres in Auckland. So we're in a prime location to complement Auckland's intensification and provide cities within cities where people work, live, shop and play for decades to come. Our journey to intensify these assets, creating thriving mixed-use communities, as Sylvia Park is the first of our assets. And sorry. so what, what are the steps we're taking to transform what is already New Zealand's favourite shopping centre into a world-class mixed asset? This is Sylvia Park today as you know it. Um, however, it's a version without all the construction that you probably see right now. It's a fantastic asset that would continue to grow. As you know, under Kiwi stewardship, it's grown from over 16 years from army storage barracks to now over 250 retailers and an office building, ANZ Rowinger, which is shown in the centre. Over the coming years, the face of Sylvia Park is set to evolve to this, and ultimately to this. A city within a city that's home to thousands of workers, residents spread across multiple residential and office towers, it is the metropolitan centre for the surrounding area, growing like Parramatta has in South Sydney. So we've been working on a master 30-year master plan, and this is a nice architectural view of it. However, you know, the last five years we've taken a step back to go, what is our plan for Sylvia Park? So to orientate yourselves, you can see the Southern Motorway down the bottom, and you can see the train station running through. The, the grey boxes is the existing retail, and from there, you can see we've got quite lofty heights of developing intensification to the site. So to the north, you can see the yellow. Uh, those buildings just up by the train line are the BTR. So we're underway with our first development there, which is built to rent apartments for people to uh, rent in. And we're a long-term holder. We won't be selling them. And then from the east to west, you can see the, um, the office spine, which we're, we're centering that around the train station which is what we're seeing a lot of our, you know, that transport oriented development for offices. The master plan sets a new standard for mixed use and transport oriented developments, and it's going to work for customers, residents, and for all. So just going into a bit more detail, since developing this plan, we've really made quick process progress in terms of where we're at. This image shows the current developments underway, whether we're either constructing or considering. Next one, thanks, Pierre. So, based on all that, I thought it would be quite critical to kind of outline what we're seeing as a landlord um, in terms of you know the, the post-COVID era and how, how we're providing it, you know, one of the many solutions that are out there because there is not one size that fits all. So there, there's a new way of work. We can all see that in our daily lives. Um, and that's prompted everyone to have a rethink of the office. And what we've seen is that there's more space, more meeting collaboration but most importantly, greater flexibility. So we're seeing a flight to quality, which is driving demand in the office leasing. We're seeing this in Auckland, throughout New Zealand, and globally, we're looking at the research and statistics. We see a number of factors underpinning this flight to quality. The first is employees. 
all occupy as our employers, and the global war for talent to attract and retain the workplace has become key. Secondly, employers care about their well-being. Employees need to recognise this and need to facilitate and provide. Thirdly, everything has gone to flexi working. This is what the talent employees want, and employees are conscious of this and need to start getting uh, and are starting to get concerned with productivity. Which is why the fourth factor comes into play, which is collaboration and client space. Occupiers and employees have seen in COVID from working from home, there was limited collaboration uh, space and very little client interaction in the human era. It was all done on Zoom like we're doing now. Which is why we're seeing that change in the office space into more less this, more meeting rooms, more collaboration space, more client space and customer engagement space. It's less about this space and more about doing stuff with people again. The fifth factor is amenities, both in the building, with end of trip, for arguments, etc., showers, lockers, uh, bike racks, towel service, through to EV charges and the immediate location employees want food and beverage, retail services, all the things that makes the employee's day easier. And finally, environmental factors themselves and organisational values around ESG and climate, driving the demand for new green six-star rated buildings, and similarly with concerns with seismic that can't be addressed with an out-of-date building. However, a new building can. These are the six factors that we're seeing underpinning the demand to a fight for quality at the moment. So how's Kiwi responding to these? Um, three to keep away. It's our current construction build project underway. It's a 7,500 metre A-grade office building at the front of Sylvia Park, uh, and it will be completed in Q1 of 2023. So this six-level office building caters to the needs of office and medical tenants, and is well suited to hub-and-spoke office configurations, small businesses, and equally large corporates. We have a number of leases already agreed, led by Anchor Tenants IWG, who will operate a full floor of co-working, providing flexible space, meeting rooms, and another amenity to the centre. We've got an engineering firm coming in, Professional Services, and then we've also got Tamaki Health and Horizon Radiology, underpinning our medical development. We're excited about this landmark building. It's accessible, it's rich in amenities, and set in a state-of-the-heart, sustainably designed environment. 3DQ Way is designed to promote and serve a vibrant tenant community, and it's a flexible, multifunction space for the modern worker, featuring a range of services and extensive energy trip facilities. It's also highly sustainable, and you know, here, here's just an image showing a different render. So this image here shows the building on the uh, left, we're calling that the pavilion, that's our medical building, which will be a dedicated um, urgent care with radiology, and then the above level will be uh, for yeah, your secondary medical, i.e. your podiatrist, your specialised services, etc. Uh, from there, we've got the main office tower, which is six levels at um, 1,000 metres of floor pipe, with the ability to have interconnecting stairs for that flexibility and also for client more engagement and staff engagement. We've really separated on this design of having uh, dual entrances so that the medical is separate from the office and that we don't, you know, with these uses complement each other, not hinder. So in terms of what else we've got in the pipeline from an office point of view, we're currently, a number of projects have been explored. It's shown are three projects which are currently underway. First is Sylvia Tower on the left. It's a 17-level mixed-use development, which has uh, 10 levels of office and then uh, 140 room hotel. We've currently got resource consent, and we will be building this just once it's demand-led. It's a real, that there from a height perspective is 72 metres, so it's really pushing the envelope on our, our height at Sylvia Park. And you can see ANZ to the left of it, which is at 50 metres, so it, it's quite an impressive tower. From there, we are now looking in the middle building, which is on Carbine Road. And as I noted earlier, we see the real opportunity for a, a east to west spine of office centred around the train station. So what, what our vision is for this site is to have a, a campus-style commercial development, which connects to the train station and main retail centre. And what we would see is using the existing red brick buildings and converting that into a kind of a funky F&B um, centre that attracts tenants and also customers. So... 
I think before, enough of me rabbiting on, I think the best way to sum up all of this is we've got a little video which just outlines our master plan and probably provides a lot more context than I can from discussing. So you can put that here, it'd be great. Very nice game. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kane. Fabulous that the video is working. That's always a, a little bit stressful for me as you go. So thank you for ensuring the link was right. Um, fantastic to see what's happening in Sylvia Park. And when we look overseas, there's a lot of this going on. And from working with a few um, tenants or um, going to Sylvia Park, one of the key that's come out from their perspective is the ability to make going to the office purposeful because what 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 people have really taken away from uh, the pandemic and the lockdowns is their time is precious and you're finding now that people are really struggling to come to the office with no purpose so having all these amenities nearby that that means that when they, they do commute to the office they have also other things that they can productively do with their time when they are here. Um, I'll have five more minutes of a few data points and some modeling that I want to show you, um, especially around utilization and what the various models that I'm seeing from overseas, how they can help bring that utilization up. Um, the first trend is what we call flex and core. So this is for um, an occupier that's or a company looking to go in a building as you could see previously from the meeting room data, there are some um, facilities that are structurally underutilized just because these are facilities that are where the utilization pattern is really fluid. Um, also, when you have project space or peaks and troughs in your headcounts, the idea is that you would take uh, a floor plate on a lease for long term on your core facilities, the ones that have the highest utilization under your work models and then within the same building you would resource to uh, on-demand space or, or shared space wherever you need it for projects for um, uh, off-sites for meeting rooms or those large boardrooms that are highly underutilized the result of that is you have a smaller leased footprint therefore lower uh, liabilities and you can tap in and out of um, the flex as required the second trend that I'm seeing coming through in Europe is that that really addresses the needs of employees who don't want to work from home but cannot or do not want to commute to the center office. And that means providing these employees with what's called third places. So you have a headquarter that has the branding, the atmosphere really embodies what the company is about. And then the dispersed workforce is supported by a network of third places, be it co-working spaces, cafes when that works, or any alternative workspaces that are not home or the office. In terms of um, a big question that always get asked, 
well, but that's very expensive. Well, actually, it's not. Um, because if we consider the structural underutilization of current office, here I've modeled a very high level example that would vary from industry to industry and company to company. But uh, for, uh, say, a hundred staff company, traditionally you'd lease 1500 square meter, your rental cost there about uh, in current terms would be 900, all of the costs, cleaning facilities, et cetera. And then from a fit out standpoint or amortization standpoint, that would be your cost. That means a total cost of 1.6 million and equivalent liabilities with a cost per head count of 16,500. As we've seen from previous utilization studies, this leased asset utilization is, is very low. Why we're talking about leased assets? Because this is becoming very important from a CFO standpoint. Um, since the introduction of IFRS 16, which are new accounting rules, um, leased is now a capital expenditure. Therefore, uh, considering its return on investment and its utilization becomes really important. If we look now at the model with a hybrid HQ, that means taking what Jay's done, uh, people on the journey, really understanding how they use the space to be able to rationalize, well, that indeed reduces your running costs, but also your liabilities and fair out exposure. Now, if we look at the core and flex here, we're removing 300 square meters of even in the an hybrid environment, the least utilized spaces. That means for the similar building, you have a lower rental cost, lower other cost, lower fit out cost. And here we have a flex space cost. So here we've allocated a portion of your space, which is going to be tapped into the same building on an on-demand basis. Like Ken mentioned, they have this offering at Sylvia Park for project space, um, overflow, meeting rooms, all these facilities that you don't have on your own lease space. That means cost is reduced, liabilities are reduced, and by default, your utilization goes up. Finally, here you have the scenario of that uh, type of flex plus um, additional suburban or satellite offices that uh, you service through service offices or co-working spaces, either at, the, at a country level or at a suburban level. Of course, there's a higher cost there, but the flip side is you're providing an easy to access workspace close to home for these employees for whom it's important. Um, so the reason I'm saying that here is globally, the quality of space in New Zealand is very low compared to uh, France, UK, or even the US. Why? Because construction here in New Zealand costs very much compared to rent. However, there is really an opportunity by partnering with landlords like um, Kane to transform that space and be able to fund it through reduced waste. It's a big passion of mine, reduced waste. So I think we have finally understood we have a finite planet, uh, finite resources, and this paradigm shift that's happened is now doing better with less, which um, I think is a really great challenge to have. On this note, this is the end for my side, and I would like to open up for questions. Um, I will also run a few polls, apologies, I forgot to uh, launch them, so I'll do that now. There's a few questions, should take you very quickly to, um, to fill up. We have a first question from Caroline Ferguson. Have you been tracking utilization figures for the not formal meeting rooms and one person meeting rooms? Yes, we have. Uh, one person meeting rooms are the phone booth and then all the other meeting rooms are actually uh, closable meeting room. We've also, our technology allows us to track every work point in real time through in, in the collaboration area. So we're able to track really uh, seat by seat and also in the workstation. What, what's come out of that is meeting rooms by default are really underutilized because of typically they're booked for longer times but used for a much shorter uh, period. And the biggest one is the inability to have the right uh, capacity for each meeting. So we end up with uh, one person sitting in one uh, 10 people boardroom or those kind of things. As you probably peer, I'll just add to that from a TNG perspective. Um, so essentially, we have introduced the technology to be able to do that. But at the moment, what we're using it for is to free up a meeting room if um, no one turns up. So we don't get rooms that are booked out when they were um, when they're actually free and available for other people to utilize them. 
for us and the feedback we had from staff was actually more around car parking. Car parking was actually where the sensitivity was. People, if they were going to come into work and they're driving to work, they wanted to ensure that they could find a car park. So that's probably where we've been doing most of our monitoring actively. Um, on that, that side of it. And so we haven't had an issue there. And also we haven't had any issues to date with our meeting room mix and blend. Um, if I was to predict a question that could come through was, did, did we over cater in our meeting rooms? Um, I think possibly we, we may have, um, but again, we were coming from a situation of feedback from staff as opposed to we didn't have the technology in our three sites or our three meeting rooms to be able to kind of really talk to the data clarity that Pierre has, has articulated. Um, so I guess for us, it's about actually building that profile as we move forward. And these are the learnings we've taken to some of the our other property decisions around where we've moved our teams into a single site to work together is actually to, to measure desk utilization and, and so on in a far more accurate kind of real way. Um, so so that would be the TNG kind of experience. Um, yeah. Oh, th thank, thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Tim to Kane. Uh, how is Kiwi addressing the third place concept around Sylvia Park? As someone who's just returned from living in Germany, there was a huge number of events run by the city property owners in order to create more community. Um, do Kiwi have a team that focuses on cre creating these events and that uh, sense of community beyond the space? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good question actually. So for us, this evolution of Sylvia Park's going from a predominant retail centre with 250 sites to suddenly incorporating different uses, office workers, retail, residential uses, and that's going to continue to grow. As, as you would have seen on that master plan, we didn't have much more retail planned. We we're kind of at that point on that. So part of us, you know, when you look at that, the, the customer experience, and when I refer to a customer, I mean an office worker in this example, our customer there doesn't maybe want to always go to the shopping center. So what we've been looking at doing is creating uh, the third space, as you call it. So at the moment, we're doing a large development called Sylvia Lane, which is creating a large public realm. Um, with 3 to Kiwi Way, we're also doing a lot of green space. And we're, we're also doing a whole exercise around Sylvia Park itself to go, what, what about the spaces in between? You know, there's the walk under the sea art, which is quite, you know, industrial at the moment, just under a motorway bridge. So how, how can we provide an, another area for people to go to, whether it's to have their lunch or to have um, uh, activations, et cetera? So, so I specifically answering that question, we, we have an activate team, which actually work on activation spaces. And um, whether that's from a rental perspective, getting, you know, a, a Coke display in there, through to even just doing, you know, chess boards and stuff like that for outdoor entertainment. And I alluded to at the start, there's something that Britomart is really, really good at, the procurement of actually procuring the space, having events there, DJs on Fridays, that type of thing. And we, we see that as something that will continue to grow. And we, we kind of want to, why do people come to the office? It's to do work, but to socialise, to have an experience. And, you know, us as a landlord, uh, another tool to uh, an occupier of providing that. Um, it's not just limited to Sylvia Park, though. At our office buildings, we're doing similar, like at ASB North Wharf, we're looking at a similar activation of the fish lane, which is um, between the fish markets and the ASB building. And it's about that procurement. So a uh, convoluted answer to your question, yeah, we do have a team, and it's something that we're continually evolve on and trying to engage with our, our customers and our office assets. Thank you, Kane. Uh, another question from the team for Jay this time. Would the TNG fit out how much did greenery, plants, etc., influence employee interest in coming and working in greener spaces? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question, Tim. And I, I guess we, we do have greenery around the space. Um, do I feel it's a strong influence? No, I don't. I, I, I think we, we, we have some. We haven't gone... Um, significantly, I won't say over the top, but 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 we 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 have touches of of plants and 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 greenery around the space just to help make it feel a bit more inviting and a bit more comfortable. We haven't had any specific specific feedback around whether people would like more or whether that's one of the motivation points for coming into the office. Um, so at this stage, I'd say it's it's, it's low. We, we we certainly have some because it's it's good to do, and and it feels more homely, but. Um, but yeah, I can't kind of comment in a specific 
metric type way to, to that question at this stage. You need to wait for the three month survey to go out. What's well, a new question I'm going to add actually? So thanks for that, Tim. So that's why. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, we have a, oh, Anthony, uh, please send us the contact details for Kiwi Property Commercial Space in Cabin Road. Okay, um, job done. I will contact you afterwards. Yeah. Um, I have well, actually, I have um, a question actually from, from myself, Kane. What I've realized is often change has many obstacles, be it especially from a lease perspective, that's a massive commitment, uh, getting stakeholders on board, getting the executive buy-in. What have you found are the biggest challenges from your side to be able to create those spaces that occupiers want at the moment? I think the biggest challenge is, and you know, there's the uncertainty. We're, we're still not sure of what this flexible working is. And there's so many different polls and surveys going around, whether it's, you know, five days a week and office three days. And I think it's going to continue to evolve. So as a landlord, what, what we, we can provide really two key things. One, we need to provide the right footprint to allow a tenant to do what they need to do, and that's by providing a high-quality product with the amenities, with the, the highly sustainable building, and also being flexible. And when I say flexible, is we're not building silly architecture-designed buildings. We're trying to build ones that are easily subdivisible, ones that can be split up and kind of flex with the tenant. And so how we do that, the name that we're and we built in you know, zones of fears so that therefore tenants can actually have that interconnectable fears. We learn a lot, a lot of lessons like that from ANZ that it really pigeonholed what people could use. So what we've done with Free to Care Who Way is we've designed certain areas and got it procured that so we can do interconnecting stairs. So we're looking at things like that about how we can accommodate the tenant's needs. Um, but then from a contractual point of view and, and getting things across, I think gone are the days of a 15-year lease. You know, as a commercial uh, property owner, we would love to do 15-year leases. But the fact is, you know, the workplace and your staffing and generational changes, the work at tomorrow in 15 years is probably still at university or school. And so how can we provide a solution on that? So from a contractual point of view, what, what we're really doing to help get deals done is really understanding what the tenant wants, you know, and how we can do that is looking at fit out. Do we do a turnkey? Do we partner with someone with the DB studios of the world who then manage that whole process? And we we, we kind of pay for it and manage it so that the, our customer doesn't have to get bogged down with doing consent. So it's almost doing turnkey. So then working through them on design, but then also, you know, funding the fit out or doing different deal structures with flexibility. So, you know, Gone are the days, like I said, the 15 year lease. We've had to adapt to the market to provide that flexibility by way of contractual flexibility through to contractual, you know, flexibility in doing deals, whether it's us doing it, the tenant doing it, or what have you. Yeah, thank you. So it's really striking that balance between the, the environment needs to change, but how do we fund that when exactly. there is a risk? Um, there's business cycles are shorter and shorter, so longer term leases are harder and harder from a tenant perspective. So perhaps the answer, as you say, is rationalizing long lease on those core facilities, which we are sure we have higher certainty will yeah. be used for the long term, complementing with, with some flexibility into it. Um, we have a question for Jay, actually. What are the three things that are the most important uh, from your perspective when starting a journey like this? Um, so I, I guess from a hybrid point of view, I, I guess it's, it's been really clear around what success would look like. So the executive buy-in, understanding what they're expecting to see as the benefits of the transitional transformation that you're going through. Um, number two would be engagement of the people impacted. Um, so understanding what the, what the new way of working um, that you're trying to create looks like and how that's going to impact upon them. And exactly to the point that's been raised before, we actually have some individuals that come into the office five days a week because actually they flat and their home office is their bedroom. So actually you can't take the default assumption that everybody's going to be two days a week. Mm -hmm. um, so you have people that, that are going to be in every single day and, and how do you cater for that? Um, 
And then I guess the, the third piece would be train support and evolve. Um, you know, it, it's not a one-time journey like culture. It takes continual investment and um, concerted, thoughtful um, direction and guidance um, on, on how that will be. So I think to the point, Pierre, that you'd raised before that, that a, you know, view it as a journey, take, a, take an approach around experimenting, being open to adapting, um, you have auditors that come in that they, they take a big room for a couple of months. You've got project teams that will stand up and, and take spaces for a period of time, all normal stuff that you just need to be able to um, keep your staff and teams, you know, open to those moments of, of, of change. Um, I guess that would be my response to that question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think indeed people and flexibility are the two things that I would retain from today. Um, we're going to close off. We have two minutes. Um, the last poll is about this event today, so please vote. Let me know how you found it, uh, which will be launched right now. And finally, um, we'll have a few announcements. We'll have this, we're creating a office utilization ebook, which will be available in a couple of weeks, uh, which will really dig into the topics we scratched on today. On the 23rd of November, we have our um, economic outlook with Tony Alexander. He's going to come in on a webinar to really give us his view of the, the next further 12 months and be uh, open to questions. So that's your, your opportunity for one-on-one -on -one interactions with him. Uh, we will be launching next year our net zero fit out calculator. This will enable our clients to design at the same time while understanding what their design choices have, what impact they have on sustainability. And uh, we're really excited about that. No brainer dashboard is also soon to be released. This will um, provide executives with real time, real life uh, metrics for their workspace from a utilization standpoint, uh, engagement, and other key metrics. And finally, we'll be launching uh, very, very soon our state of hybrid survey. If you see it in your inbox, please take the time to answer. And we'll be um, hosting a series of workshops um, um, so in the new year. The idea here is to bring uh, thought leaders together and really create that content, those ideas to uh, share a roadmap with the broader community. As we've seen, there's fantastic opportunities to improve community, employees and businesses through hybrid. So please join us on the journey to help us do that. Uh, and I hope you really enjoyed um, the content today. Um, if you didn't, please don't vote. Otherwise, please vote.